Um, and uh, I think not. And um, uh, I'm so glad you'd be here. We're, we're we're talking about some big ideas, but we some, some big ideas that we think are are, are timely. Uh, HJR 44, uh, the resolution 44, the right to vote amendment. In fact, it's already introduced in Congress and it's building on a, a, a history of um, several Congresses that have been debating the right to vote amendment. We're going to talk about that. And then we'll take a little break, and then in two, we will be addressing the issue of, of redistricting and our proposal to, by statute, to change the way we do redistricting to a fair representation system, which we will explain the one that, that we think is uh, the best way to provide the universal opportunity for everyone to have their right to vote and actually count for representation. Um, but our chair is Chris Monselich, and I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Chris, who uh, you may know as a man of many hats, but uh, he has been an author of the French government and a chair of our board for several years, and a board member for longer, it wears his hats well, and uh, has a music history as well that is deeply inducted into the Rock Hall of Fame in Mr. Peace. And what a grand this year. Thank you for that introduction, Ron. Thanks, everybody, for coming here. And um, I'm Chris Novoselic. I'm the chair of the board of Fairvote. I've been working with Fairvote now for about 15 years. So how did I get involved with this kind of political work? It was in uh, Seattle, Washington State in the um, early 90s. And <coughs> Seattle music was taking the music world by storm. At the same time in our legislature, we had the anti uh, censorship bill in local level. There was like teen dance ordinance, uh, anti music performance, anti young people, anti music fan. So I didn't want to be against things, so I thought I'd be for something. And uh, to be for an inclusive music community, to be for uh, more opportunities for people of all ages to be involved in music. And uh, <clears throat> That's how I got my civic education and how does you know, politics work, how does the city council work, how does the state legislature work. So we started an advocacy group, jam pack, and along the way I found more barriers to participation. You know, uncontested elections, uncompetitive elections, entrenched incumbents, uh, polarized uh, lawmakers, uh, close-minded people, a cynical uh, voters, cynical music fans, and uh, at the time I was on the word search engine Alta Vista, and uh, I started to uh, word search inclusive democracy, election reform, and uh, one group was uh, doing this kind of work, and it was fair about the Center for Voting and Democracy, and um, I was really, that's where I learned about American versions of uh, proportional representation, different types of uh, ways to elect our uh, leaders than uh, these ways that create these barriers. And uh, I, got, I, got, I got hooked, and I see a lot of uh, potential for it, not only in uh, Washington State, but in the U.S. House, in, in uh, national elections. So, um, we're here today, we're going to talk about a uh, right to vote amendment in the United States Constitution. Again, how do we break these barriers down or just open the doors and let more people in? We believe that a affirmative right to vote in the United States Constitution would be a way to do that. And Rob's going to talk uh, about that in a, in a bit. We're going to talk about uh, reforming elections for the U U.S. House of Representatives. And I'll have a lot more to say about that. So what, what on our program we're gonna I'll just briefly uh, introduce Grace. Uh, oh okay. So thank you Chris. Um, I wanted to make sure for those uh, uh, here explicitly to, to, to look at the, the right to vote the constitution issue this is a very good resource that we produced last summer um, soon after uh, House Trade Resolution 44 was introduced um, and explains uh, the history of this issue over time. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that history in a moment. I uh, think that um, there's, there's a, a somewhat counterintuitive aspect of this because we hear over and over again, right, that the right to vote is fundamental. In fact, if you do a citizenship test as a new, as a uh, person becoming a citizen of the U.S., that's 
that's one of the questions is like, what's the most fundamental right for the right to vote? We also, though, are a country that's been around a long time, and what the, defi the definition of what a right to vote meant in the 19th and 18th century was rather different than what it means today, or it was something that there certainly wasn't the kind of agreement in this common uh, law's understanding of the right to vote is so fundamental when you think about what suffrage was in the 18th century, right? It was a lot more restricted than today. Um, so we have built a regime of elections and of democracy since then, grounded on a constitution that does not, did not have to build any reference to the right to vote. And then over time, we've had constitutional amendments that have expanded certain classes of people to provide equal opportunities to vote with everyone else. But that's not the same as an explicit individual right to vote. And it doesn't mean that those initial people are actually having their right to vote necessarily protected in the way that we all assume it is. And there are some direct implications of that um, that uh, I think are very timely right now, perhaps more than ever. Um, and uh, that's what our legal fellow, Race Akbar, has been doing a lot of work on and uh, uh, grounded in, again, in this very good analysis. One thing that I'll, I'll, I'll say before I turn it off to Grace, just one more point, is that um, I believe that if we could figure out a way to take voting rights off the partisan table, we could take the right to vote off the issue of, of, of something that we might look at to try to gain the system, we'd all be better. And I think about an analogy of say, sports. Um, if you uh, were able as a ba the home basketball team to adjust the height of the basket, to put grease on the floor, to, to, to change certain fundamental rules of the game, and you knew that there would be an impact of doing so, you would be tempted to do so if you were allowed to do so. But I think we have a much better game of basketball that everyone likes playing better when you can't do that, right? And I think that that's where we need to be on the right to vote. We need to take this value that we all believe is fundamental and actually establish it that way. And I think we'll all be better off. Uh, that's that's my point. Kind of but let's I can turn over. Thanks everyone. Um, my name is Ray Sokmar. I'm an attorney in Maryland. I'm also a legal fellow at Fair Vote. Um, and I wanted to begin by talking about why this constitutional amendment to define the right to vote is even necessary in the first place. Um, by the way, one, one quick question. Is there some room? And I don't want people crowded by the door. People might get backed up a bit. There, there might yeah, be. Oh, yeah, a few chairs. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, just so the door doesn't get very crowded. Right, so if a lot of people think there already is a right to vote, if you ask the public, they might not be able to say where in the Constitution this right is or that right is, but they think they have it. And it's perfectly natural for them to think that. You, if you're a democracy, democracies ought to have uh, rights, voting rights enshrined in their foundational documents. Um, but it's not in ours. Uh, what we have in the U.S. National Constitution is we have a series of amendments enacted over a period of time that gradually expand the franchise to this group of that group. We've got uh, the 15th Amendment extended the right to vote to the newly enfranchised slaves. There was the 17th Amendment, uh, which uh, changed the way the U.S. Senators were elected so they'd be directly elected rather than elected by state legislatures. The 19th Amendment extended it to women. The 23rd allowed citizens of the District of Columbia to vote for President of the United States. And that was 1970-something, so it was fairly recent, actually, that, that uh, residents of the District of Columbia, the national capital, were unable to vote for the President of their country. There was the 24th Amendment, um, which ended the poll tax, and then there was the 26th Amendment, the second most recent amendment to the Constitution, which uh, established that 18-year-olds could participate uh, in elections. So this is what we have. We have amendment after amendment after amendment, but we don't have an affirmative right to vote in there. Um, if we did, if there was a, a provision to the U.S. Constitution that said there is an affirmative right to vote for every U.S. citizen, then a lot of these other amendments uh, would be included within that. So this is a comprehensive solution. Just putting it in the Constitution will solve a lot of problems. Um, so one, one example of why this is necessary from a lawyer's perspective is what happens in litigation. Uh, when, a, when a suit is filed uh, claiming that, that there's an infringement on the right to vote, how do you analyze that? What kind of, of considerations go, go into determining whether that claim has merit? Um, 
The Supreme Court has developed over, over its history a concept called standards of review. If you are lawyers in the room, you are familiar with that. Uh, it essentially means that how closely will a court examine the reasons for a given legislative act. Um, if the legislative act in question impacts something that is not considered a fundamental right, then the court is inclined to give a lot of deference to the legislature. But if it is something that affects a fundamental right, the court is going to go through a lot of effort to determine whether the reasons offered for that position really stand up. So this is why it matters whether the right to vote is considered fundamental, not simply as a rhetorical device, but is fundamental as a matter of law. And that question is really undetermined right now. There are times when the court has spoken as if it was fundamental, but there are also other times in which it has said that it is not fundamental. So having a, a right to vote amendment to the Constitution will settle that. It would say that the right to vote is fundamental, so that any legislature, national or state or local, passed a law that restricted or potentially restricted the right to vote, then the reasons for doing so will have to be examined very, very closely. Um, there's a uniformity problem. In, in America, elections of by and large are administered by local authorities. Even federal elections. Uh, the Constitution, Article 1, Clause 4, gives Congress the authority to regulate federal elections. Uh, but in most recently, in the case out of Arizona, the Supreme Court said, this is interesting, uh, the Supreme Court said Congress has the authority to regulate the time, the place, and the manner of federal elections, but it does not have the authority to determine who is qualified to vote in federal elections. Is, which is an interesting position to take, but that is the position the Supreme Court has taken. Uh, a right to vote amendment to the Constitution and the subsequent legislation that would follow would change that. Uh, the authority to determine who can cast a vote in federal elections would likely be something that would then fall within the purview of the U.S. Congress. Uh, as seems logical, given that a federal election is run by rules set by the U.S. Congress. Um, so there are uniformity concerns at play when you have when you don't have a fundamental right to vote in the Constitution. Uh, there's also the problem of how state constitutional provisions are interpreted. Forty-nine of the fifty states have provisions in their state constitutions that say that citizens have the right to vote. That sounds wonderful, but how does that actually translate into action? Uh, unfortunately, many state courts have a tendency to quote unquote lockstep. This is the term that we use in, in this discourse. Um, lockstep federal law in this question, which, which is to say that when a federal court interprets a provision of the federal constitution dealing with voting, the state court tends to follow that lead, even though potentially the state constitutions give more rights and more freedom to voters because their provisions are generally more expansive, as they have to be because there is no right to vote in the U.S. Constitution. So any right to vote in the state constitution is definitionally more expansive than, than there is in the federal constitution. Uh, a right to vote amendment to the federal charter uh, would would definitely happen and an improvement uh, would definitely be an improvement um, because it would mean that if a state is looking for guidance on how to navigate a right to vote issue and if it is already inclined to follow the federal lead, then the federal lead ought to be a good one in this respect. That's, it's not to say that states are required to or need to always follow the federal lead, but if they choose to do so, we want to make sure that the path they're following is one that, that increases participation and increases um, voting for all citizens of the U.S. Uh, so I um, don't have too much time left, so I'll just mention one last thing, which is that um, America is a nation composed of states, and yet it has pieces in it that are not states. The District of Columbia, the Virgin Islands, the other territories, the Puerto Rico. Um, the Constitution speaks of voting as something that is an interaction between voters and states and the national government. It doesn't really talk too much about the territories. It doesn't talk about the district of Columbia. And yet there are millions of people living in these areas. And they, they are in a, in a sort of limbo. They are in a gray area where it's not certain what their rights to vote and representation really are in some firm way. Uh, Congress certainly can extend various voting rights by statute, but that also means that they can take it away by statute. Uh, we want, we, we expect that a constitutional right to vote amendment would put those people on some solid ground the way that their, their compatriots in the states um, comparatively are, uh, are. So those are, those are some reasons why uh, it is not uh, clear that this thing is just redundant. It, it's, 
not redundant, it will actually have a clear impact on millions of people. Uh, in a, and uh, it would also provide much clarity for lawyers trying to, to negotiate the system. So, so I was quite rushed. I apologize for, for the brevity, but we do have a very little time. So I believe there's a few questions at the end right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And um, let me just um, talk about a couple uh, aspects of this that I think are important to have more people. There are definitely chairs to find. Um, uh, people can make room. That would be great. Um, so, um, one is I talked about the fact that in the uh, 18th century, um, there wasn't this universal acceptance of the right to as we think of it today. However, I think an important part of this is that the idea of elections and of having uh, the importance of elections actually was very important as part of the debate over the Constitution. Um, and they had to grapple with the fact that they thought elections were really important. So, the House of Representatives, we're in a building of the House of Representatives. <coughs> Um, just a couple things to think about when you think about elections here. So there's a couple seats here for, for people looking for spots. Um, is that um, we have never had someone serve in the U.S. House who hasn't been elected. You can't be appointed by a governor when there's a vacancy. There's no situation where you can serve in the House of Representatives without being elected. And that's been true since the beginning. Because that was a value that was established from the beginning. They're up every two years. They're the ones that, of the branch, within the checks and balances system that we have, that's where the democracy was being channeled, right? That's, that, that, that was, and that was seen as quite important. And in some ways, if you look at the different powers that are enumerated for the, for the different branches and then within Congress, the House and Senate, the House is pretty darn important, right? They're the only body that then can declare war. We don't always maybe have that turn into reality today, but that, that's true. Uh, they appropriate money. The Senate doesn't appropriate money. The, the House has to start that. Um, and uh, they impeach federal officials. The Senate only tries people who have already been impeached by the House. Anyway, there's some things that are quite important about the House. Um, and, and so they talked about suffrage early on um, in, in those early debates. And they established that the way to move forward in this complicated situation where different colonies at that time, new, you know, sort of emerging states, had different rules for suffrage. And they did, actually. Pennsylvania had a, a much more liberal suffrage law, say, than Massachusetts. Um, but they said, OK, well, let's at least establish that the states have a level of equality within them, and that they felt that sort of the rising tide, I think, would move toward, toward the right to vote being protected more and more that way. So that they established that, that, that you can't uh, that, that, the, that anyone who can vote for the, uh, say, legislature has to be able to vote for Congress. That, that, would, that, would, that was a provision to, 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 to inject this sort of thought about voting. So we're not turning over the founders. We're, in a sense, uh, part of the evolution that, as Ray summarized, is, is something that we've seen over the last 220 years, which is this expansion of suffrage that's taken place in really interesting ways, right? And, 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 and it's all kinds of ways. So it's like people without property. Um, that, that was generally done by statute. Almost always started, by the way, locally. So localities do something, then it gets up to states, and that practice becomes a norm, and eventually that gets to the point where it becomes a national norm, and sometimes it gets into the Constitution. Um, but that's the history of, 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 of suffrage expansion. And at a certain point, we began to think of the right to vote as fundamental. But as race talked about also, there are, are real holes in the, the, the system today. Um, so, and this comes up in real litigation. So we're in the District of Columbia, right? So as, as, as race said, there was a Constitution Amendment to establish the right to vote for president. There's been lawsuits to say, well, the people of the district uh, should be able to vote for some of the House of Representatives. They're, they serve in wars, they, they live right here, and, and they, uh, their numbers are bigger than Wyoming, and they come on. Um, and, uh, and, and there's been a divided judge, there, you know, the, the federal judges that have looked at this have been divided. They've been divided actually on each of the things that I'm about to mention, just to show that it can be a divided question. But the, the absence of strict scrutiny for the protection of the individual right to vote, at the end of the day, tips the balance. Um, and, and, and so that's been true of challenges to get voting rights for people in the District of Columbia, for Congress. 
has been true of people, the citizens who live in territories, have had a split vote, the Court of Appeals, about whether they should have a right to vote for president, which, by the way, the, the citizens in the territories today you know, serve in the military at higher rates than uh, uh, people that live in the, uh, the, the 50 states. Um, if someone from the territory moves to uh, a state, within weeks they can, they can vote, you know, right? but if you move to a territory and establish residency there, you can no longer vote for federal office, but if you move to France, you still can, right, because you can vote as an office as well. Um, and uh, it's uh, other ways, too, but the, you know, a huge category is people with felony convictions. Uh, that's become a, a, an issue recently with Senator Paul, but uh, speaking out against that practice in uh, Kentucky on the state level is likely to have a ballot measure to expand suffrage rights for people with felony convictions. It's a state decision right now, right? So it's, so it's very much a state decision about some key things. That affects about 5 million American citizens. It's a lot of people. Um, and that's been litigated. There's been split courts, but ultimately those challenges have uh, not required extended voting rights to uh, citizens who have felony convictions. Um, and um, there's other examples of this too. I'll, I'll just, you, you're probably familiar with the big Shelby case last year about the Voting Rights Act, right? So the Voting Rights Act, which, which, which provided levels of, of increased protection for uh, areas of the country that had um, a history of discrimination that was affecting voter turnout rates, um, the, the coverage formula, what states were covered by that provision, was struck down and effectively made the whole act, that, or that the preclearance practice, you know, stalling it, it uh, being used. And, and there's been some action since then that would suggest that maybe that wasn't such a good thing because there's been a number of changes going on at state and local levels in uh, these states that are that are now kn knowing that their actions are, are not having a degree of oversight, taking actions that they almost certainly could not have done before the Supreme Court changed that. Uh, so that's affecting suffrage, right? And it's affecting suffrage in areas that had that protection, but then lots of other areas of the country didn't have that protection because they weren't pretty clear, and they would do things that would affect suffrage, but there wasn't really a remedy to it there because there isn't this blanket coverage uh, for the right to vote. Um, and the Voting Rights Act is, a, is, is and, and, and it's, it's the, 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 the law to, to, to try to address that is another issue that's moving forward this sort of this overall context. Um, and uh, the Presidential Commission on Voting just came out with a report. Who, I'm going to ask you to see a raise hand. Who has been aware that the Presidential Commission on Voting came out with a report? Who has actually read it? <laughs> um, it's actually really good. Um, and it's bipartisan. It was done by you know, the chief lawyers for Obama and Romney. And they have this uh, strong set of recommendations. And it's really quite disturbing when you read it because they're saying like we have this crisis in voting equipment that's just, you know, we did the Help America Vote Act a decade ago and now, um, you know, that equipment that was largely purchased a decade ago is like falling apart and the certification process is entirely broken because the Election Assistance Commission doesn't have any commissioners and so they can't actually enforce, you know, they, they, they can't make their standards better and the standards process is all broken. And it's like, boy, what a mess. And they're thinking of like creative ways to, to get around that. And they talk about a voter registration system, right? About one third of eligible voters are not registered, and a whole bunch of people are registered more than once. I bet if I look around this room, and I look at the age of people here, I bet there's a chunk of people in this room who are registered more than one place right now. Not because of your fault, but just because you left one place and you registered somewhere new, and you're still on the rolls in the old place, and you have an incredibly inefficient system that creates fear and angst and concern about our voter rolls quite understandably and it creates the climate where we can have this battle over something that should be done efficiently and though they have good recommendations to do it better and a whole number of things like this right and yet there's no cheat to do any of it so it's all advisory it's good ideas it's the right thing to do and we'll see where it gets down but i don't think it's going to get done in many places and even though you know we know these things are a problem and if we have another floor to 2000 in, in, in 2016, and that state, whatever state it is, Ohio or whatever, is in that decisive role, we'll have the same messy conversation and the belief we had an indecisive wrong outcome, and because we don't have the rules set straight, we're just not taking it seriously. And I think that's part of the value of having this conversation about a fundamental right to vote. 
um, and saying let's actually move forward. So the, the specific proposal that is now put forward is by Congressman Ellison and Pocan, um, and uh, they uh, have, have, have done it in a, a simple way. So I can read the entire text. Every citizen of the United States who is of legal voting age shall have the fundamental right to vote in any public election held in the jurisdiction in which a citizen resides. That's section one. Section two is Congress shall have the power to enforce and implement this article by appropriate legislation. Um, and that's it. So it, it doesn't necessarily address the things we just went over, right? But it creates the opportunity that a court will suddenly look at this in, in a different way. So some of the specific kinds of franchise issues, suffrage issues that, that I talked about would have the potential for a court to say, you know what? That actually really does violate every citizen in the United States who agree of the voting age and have the fundamental right to vote in any public election held in the jurisdiction in which the citizen resides. You know, that, we interpret that to mean something different than they might do today. Um, but it takes an approach where it's not explicit. So another way to do a suffrage amendment might be much more explicit. And we have, we're lucky to have Frank Watkins here. Frank worked with uh, Congressman Jackson, who had another version of a right to vote amendment for uh, several years that at some point uh, got up to almost 60, 61 co-sponsors in one session. Um, and it had certain details that were more specific, right? There are, shall be election day registration, as sort of one example. Um, and that's an approach, right? But, but, but this approach takes sort of a value-centered approach that is really in the spirit of the Bill of Rights, right? In an affirmative way. Um, but then it creates a foundation upon which we build that's a different foundation than today. And the very effort to get it is also uh, very important in itself. And that's actually what I wanted to make sure Patricia Hart explained the strategy that we see that is a think nationally and act nationally as best we can, but also act locally right now and do things that advance suffrage right now in the spirit of this national cause. And that's uh, this idea of the Promoter Vote Project, which Patricia will explain. Thank you.
um, suggested, um, and trying to make their own elections better where they are. Some of the things that we've seen have been really interesting policies. Um, once you turn the, turn the conversation around and believe that voting is a fundamental right, you stop thinking about who deserves the right to vote and who doesn't, and you start thinking about how you can make the voting better in America. So um, we worked with one city who that lowered, that passed the right to vote resolution, which is our primary organizing tool at Fair Vote um, on the local level for voting rights. Um, once they passed this resolution, it got the whole community on the same page, and then they started thinking, you know, well, what can we do to make voting better in other ways? So um, some of the things they did was um, they opened up uh, voting rights to people with felony convictions directly after they leave prisons. They um, opened up apartment buildings to candidates so they could come into their buildings and knock on the doors and actually talk to the people who are the least likely to vote in their communities. Um, one of the most interesting things they did was they lowered the voting age to 16. Um, I remember when uh, Ralph and I first heard about it, they were like, oh gosh, <laughs> that's so bizarre. Um, but we did more research on it. And the more research we did, the more we learned that it was actually a really smart policy. The earlier you vote, the more likely you are to become a habitual voter. Um, and the 16 and 17 year olds in that city turned out at four times the rate of those over 18. And it was in an uncontested municipal election. So um, over the last year, we found that there are a lot of things that people can do on the local level. Um, our strategy is to pass a resolution, get everyone on the same page, read, let these issues breathe, um, and then we'll look at practical policy and um, practices, changes that you can make in your own community. I want to draw everyone's attention to this report uh, because uh, a colleague of mine wrote it, uh, Molly Tilly, she's no longer with us, she's, she's at a fancy hall. Um, she's done some excellent research, um, and it would be great for you all to read over it. It focuses on HJA um, HR resolution uh, 44, the POCAN bill that is for a constitutional right to vote. Um, and it will give you all the basics that you need to bring back to your office. A lot of these things that we're doing on the local level are trying to feed into what we can do on the national level. Um, I think I'm a strong believer in you know, real change starts where you are. Um, so I'm working with people where they are, but I also want to bring this to you all because you all are in important positions and um, I think that this would be a great report for you to read and to bring back to your office. So thanks. Uh, I think we're going to open it up to questions or thoughts. Um, we have some really great resources in the room. I know that Frank Watkins, we already pointed him out, but uh, he's worked on this issue for years and years and years and has incredible insight. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes before we're going to break. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to take some questions and then um, uh, take a short break and then start the, the 2 o'clock meeting. So, some of you might not agree with everything we've said or have questions about strategy or specifics. So, uh, Race is I'm back here. sort of come on up. And Patty near, is nearby. Chris might not have an answer. And just, uh, we, we'd love to hear from you. Single digit turnout, 4% turnout of those two votes, that kind of thing. 
So we think there's a whole conversation to have about that. But I think it, it ideally in the context of how we treat suffrage and think about it that is grounded in this point about isn't it time to establish that this conventional wisdom we have a fundamental right to vote is in fact a legal truth. And it, when it's a legal truth, we think of there'll, there'll be some, some ramifications of that. I think it will take, say, the, the, the serious problems we have with, with voting equipment and voter registration, the real mechanics. You can't get that right. Um, there was just a new study done, uh, international study, very respected, um, of course, other country. Uh, but it looks at all the, the voting practices around the world and of the Western democracies, the sort of you know, NATO and the, the countries we're familiar with in Europe. Um, I think there's 26 that they identified in this study. And the country that's last in election integrity, in, in having a process that one can say faithfully reflects its citizens' uh, intent is the United States. Mm -hmm. We'd like to say we have the best democracy in the world. In fact, if you are on radio shows and things, you sort of need to say that to get on the same side with people. But let's get serious. We, we actually don't have the best democracy in the world. And, and, and that's part of it, is that we need to have this conversation about can we have a right to vote constitution? Can we put these two sentences in, right, that are short and clear, and can't we all agree that that's actually something that's coming? Uh, quick question, then I have a, a more significant question. What was the study you said? That put us um, on? Do we know? Yeah, so, yeah uh, nice. it was reported by a professor named Pippa Norris from Harvard. Okay. Uh, just came Fine. out in the last few days. Um, and then my other question is, can you speak a little to the political reality of getting an amendment passed? Um, I, I believe that every generation has amended the Constitution, so you know I'm on your side. But um, I know there's only two ways to do it. You can get two-thirds of both houses to vote. For, to propose an amendment, or you can get two thirds of the states to demand a convention to propose an amendment. And I heard you talk a lot about local organizing and using that to pressure, you know, the national government. Most amendments come from states actually calling for a convention to propose an amendment, and then end up with the federal government proposing it at the end of the day. So, is there, you know, what's the political reality of actually getting this proposed out of Congress? And if not, if that's not realistic, what are we doing at the state level to actually leverage what we can do at the state level to, to force them to act? Right. Well, I'll, I'll answer that briefly, and then I'll let Frank add to it. I think that part of what I believe is is is, is exceptionally good about this promote our vote strategy is that every week we'll make progress that's direct and tangible. So when Montgomery County, Maryland, which is counting million people, passed a right to vote resolution, they created a voter turnout task force. They're halfway through the process. They're coming through recommendations. They're going to use some of the recommendations in June. They're looking at how they might move toward an automatic registration at the county level. They're grappling with the issue of turnout. They're making change right now. So that's part of the answer is we will see movement as long as this conversation is focused and, and concrete and uh, tied to the aspiration. The actual amendment itself is one that uh, I'm going to let Frank, Frank uh, present his, his vision of how that might happen. So Frank Watkins is with the Rainbow Coalition and also has a long history of, of, of really being this, you know, the congressional uh, inspiration for this. Well, I was just going to respond to the, uh, your question about how realistically uh, it is. The 27th Amendment <clears throat> took 74,000 in three days to get. The 26th Amendment took 100 days because of the Vietnam War. So getting something in the Constitution is basically a matter of the political climate that you change you know, around that. So I think most people recognize that you have a state right to vote in most instances, except for the states that have the ex felon laws that require the devil to vote. You have a state right to vote, but not a citizenship right to vote. You have a Texas right to vote, but not an American right. In Illinois, I'm trying to get on the ballot in November of 2016 a non-binding question, which is the right to vote, is a, right, a fundamental right to vote, is not explicitly in the U.S. Constitution. Do you or would you support adding an explicit fundamental individual right to vote in the Constitution? Yes, no. And hopefully that means Every newspaper has to 
come to grips with that and grapple with it. There's a lot of discussion that goes on relative to it. You know, so you're educating people. And I think that's really the key is to educate people to what the facts are, many of which were shared with today. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, I think that if you have a growing consensus with a lot more members on board with this value, that's really what it is, right? The constitutional amendments like this, it's like, do I accept this as a value? I'm just going to have one sentence answer to the students. Like, if parents are not on this amendment, there's at least a question mark about one's commitment to the value of the right to life. But, casting dispersions, <laughs> but, but, but it is essentially a pretty simple statement with some concrete implications that need to be looked at. But then I think as, as we move forward, then something like Florida 2000 happens. And the next time it happens, we're then we recognize that, that we still haven't fixed the problem. The next suffrage thing that becomes an embarrassment it's a lot more likely to be just exercising. Because when constitutional amendments pass, they often move very quickly. Low and going to age of 18 move very quickly in the context of the Vietnam War. And I believe that all these, you know, the average age of someone dying in Vietnam was 19, and they couldn't vote. So people that's just wrong, and we got to change that. Um, and, and, and I think there'll be a context, and, and, and having that move forward then allows that moment to be Yes? Uh, so um, another aspect of this is the actual elections themselves ability to have them be fair. So I was wondering what you would think about the idea of creating a coalition between voting rights and campaign finance reform for under the banner of free and fair elections. Because in a lot of ways, what's the point of voting, voting if you know the stacks that have already been, been picked because of the way that money works in politics? We'll see where people do. Certainly some of the same people uh, who like this issue also like taking vigorous action, including constitutional change relating to money politics. I think that there are um, there's some people that might not want to take that approach. I think it's always one of these sort of complexities of coalition politics. Um, and I think that um, I'd like to see them move forward. I'd like them each move separately. And we'll see what ultimately happens when they finally move. But I think there's a common conversation about what a democracy is about, which I think the 2 o'clock briefing, which is about congressional elections and fair representation, is a part of that conversation, too, which, by the way, does not get constitutional. Uh, yes, we're Greg, and then we'll just go right back from there. Let's right. get back to Frank's point. Is there maybe then a collective strategy that says that, that, no, that the 2016 presidential election becomes a place for us to run as many of those Illinois amendments as possible and get it in the presidential debates and get it as a part of the polling that goes out and get people on the record so that we have some room. I think that's the clearest space we have between our reality and trying to get some even if we get it in five to six states, it would be better to work on that. Is there any thought that yeah. might have a problem? I mean, I think that's an exciting thought. It's an expensive thought. It's a big thought. But, but I think it's one that uh, certainly there's a history of that being mm -hmm. a way to advance an issue. And uh, however one might think about the issue of same-sex marriage, as it's moved forward with first a losing ballot measure and then some winning ballot measures, you know, it, 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 it became a different kind of issue. Um, and, um, but certainly as a defining issue, right? It, it's a way of, of establishing that the mouthing of support for the right to vote, does it come with actual commitment to it? I think it's that's an important conversation. That's that sort of input would I think would be good for. Uh, do you think that the Australian model that legally requires citizens to vote would be fairer than the American model, even if the resolution is adopted? Um, that's a kind of policy that we're seeing talked about in these voter turnout task forces. And um, I'll, I'll say that the, uh, it's not just Australia. Several countries have this idea of making voter voting. Which doesn't mean, by the way, you have to vote. You have to show up and be there and you can write a big, you know, smiley face, frowning face, or whatever, right? Um, but you just say, you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a part of this democracy, you don't need to show up. Um, I think it's one that um, we don't have a position on at Fair Vote, um, but I think it's, it's the kind of issue that we'd like to see have a dialogue about. And, and, and here's, here's what happens. Once you start passing these resolutions, these right to vote resolutions, and, and, and committing to the right to vote, those conversations naturally follow. Um, we talked a little bit about Tacoma Park and, and the voting age change. 
uh, which, by the way, is another issue that I think is very likely to expand as one looks at it, gives it the second look that comes with having, uh, I think, having this conversation. But they also did a change that we, from what we know, has actually not had not been done outside of Minnesota, which is to say that every candidate has the right to canvas inside apartment buildings that otherwise might be locked to them. And that's actually affected about 50% of the city. That 50% of the city was, was beyond access to the candidates who do lots of grassroots, like they do lots of door knocking, it's that kind of election, and they couldn't do it with all the apartment tenants, and their turnout rates were much, much lower than homeowners. It's not the only reason, but it's a contributing So anyway, they, they changed that. So anyway, these, these dialogues happened. We haven't thought of that policy, but they did, and we hope to see, uh, you know, kind of the whole urgent and incentive that I just about something. I know you mentioned Tacoma Park um, and the ordinance. I was wondering how many other ordinances Yeah, so some, some college campuses are starting to pass them too. And, and, and what's interesting is you, know, you pass them on a college campus and they can actually do a whole lot about suffrage also. Like they can get they can get the administration to be helping all the students to figure out any new laws that might make it hard for students to vote. They can lobby for uh, having more polling places. Um, they can, you know, get recruiting students to be poll workers, which is a, a big need in this country, that kind of thing. So, so we've seen several of, 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 of those. The biggest ones that have passed are Prince George's County and Montgomery County. Um, but also, it hasn't, you know, I think we'll have to see what groups with real constituencies want to take this on, but I think once they do, they'll find a ready audience for it. Uh, we found that, uh, like the Montgomery County one, went from being introduced to pass unanimously in a month, and then they, they did the final um, press conference, and they had um, uh, the mayor of D.C. came out for it, because part of it called for uh, doing something about D.C. voting rights. They had Ben Cardin, the senator, come. They had Congressman Van Hollen, you know, all sort of standing there with actually a very uh, real commitment to what the right vote meant, with also the right Minnesota turnout task force, which is 15 people that meet like, twice a week. So good things going on. Other questions? Yes? Do you think that having uh, the first Tuesday in November as a national holiday would help turn out as well as having vote suppression? It might. There's, there's some questions about how much um, voter turnout is affected by access and how much is affected by other things. But it should be looked at. I, I think if, uh, like when I talked about the Texas primaries, um, it wasn't on a holiday, to be sure. But um, it's the same set of rules the same day of the week as the general election, 79% of people voted versus you know, 65. So I mean, and it's, and it's, and it's, there's other things that we need to get out about um, why people are voting or not voting. Um, but I think that that's, that's one that has, has a lot of support. And again, we'd love to see states experiment, but also sort of take it seriously. What are we going to do to have people exercise the right to vote? So uh, unless we have it, we have any questions. Yeah, I want to prank a couple other comments. One, if I <clears throat> use the term hell. Does anybody know what that, what, does that mean anything? What is it heller? What term? Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R. Second okay. Heller is a Supreme Court decision against D.C. that said you have a fundamental individual right to a gun. So we have the ironic situation that in the so-called world center of democracy, you have the fundamental individual right to a gun, but you don't have the fundamental individual right to vote. It's an interesting argument uh, that you can present to more conservative people or people who are, you know, gun ho about the gun, that they value the gun more than they value uh, democracy. I have a question of everyone here. I take it most of you are staff members of congressional members. Is that accurate or not. Okay. I'm wondering um, where your memory is in terms of becoming a co-sponsor of House Joint Resolution 44. And if you happen to know, if they're not already signed on, why not? Are they saying, well, we're concentrating on fixing Shelby? 
you know, the 65 Voting Rights Act. That's, we don't want to. We don't want to do anything that will interfere with the fix of 65. They're just not aware of House Joint Resolution 44 or what are the arguments against their becoming uh, co-sponsors. Any awareness? And it might be it, it's a proper awareness. Um, but that's a good question to be asking your member. Let us know, but certainly let the uh, um, and, and, and so we have material that where you can be in touch with uh, Patricia and others and Frank at the, the Naval Coalition's strong backer with them and others. Um, so maybe I'm going to turn it back to Chris to give a teaser. Well, thank you for coming, but also give a teaser for the truth. I'm going to give a teaser? Yeah, give a teaser. <laughs> <laughs> so what, still time until... No, 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 because we have to give people a chance to get up and talk. But we don't want you to leave. We just want you to get a chance to talk.